Good afternoon. Um, my name is Ivan Haschic. It's coming. And um, I'm here with my colleague Mikhail Maas. We are in the OECD Environment Directorate in a team uh, working on environmental information and indicators. So why are we interested in Earth observation? Well, we collect a little bit of data from countries, official statistics, but there is such an explosion of demands on our team to supply environmental data and statistics for other analytical teams across the house that we need to turn to other sources like Earth observations, a uh, great resource. So we are very much, uh, you know, always keen to learn about um, the great work you're doing, uh, the, the especially the global product for our purposes. So, um, uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present our work. It's, it's a very interesting workshop. So uh, in this case, um, uh, we will cover um, biodiversity. There is a lot of demand to, uh, there's demand to, to provide information about biodiversity. Uh, everyone in this room knows, knows why, what is, what is the problem, um, that there are pressures, uh, that there are potential extinctions, uh, reductions in ecosystem services, etc. Importantly, land and sea uh, use changes are considered as a predominant factor driving global biodiversity loss. Um, and um, of course, there are different ways to measure biodiversity. You can measure species, genetic or ecosystem diversity. I won't go into the details, but uh, in, uh, in none of these cases, there is good data globally at, across countries to, to really support um, uh, analytical work. For this reason, uh, when we first started working on this, we, we turned to land cover maps as a, as a potential proxy to, um, to, to measure um, important changes on the ground, so that would fall under the ecosystem diversity notion here. So, um, yeah, as I said, when, about 10 years ago when we started working on this, um, uh, we, so the conclusion was that um, in the absence of good quality data harmonized across countries, global land cover data were identified as a suitable alternative. Um, however, there are challenges because, um, as you will see, uh, the results are not always uh, coherent with uh, national data, national statistics. Um, and so, in this work that Mikael will present the, the details, we are using really the global uh, land cover maps to monitor, as, as, a, as a proxy to monitor pressures on ecosystems and biodiversity. Um, we are mostly interested in the conversions from the more natural land cover types to the more anthropogenic. And I'll stop here and uh, let Mikael continue. Thank you. Um, so in this piece of work, we looked at 19 different land cover data sources that are available. Um, this is not finite, there's probably more. Um, and we really wanted to look at different aspects of these, which one would be best suitable for creating these indicators. Um, there's three data sources that we looked at that um, we wanted to study in more detail. That's the Climate Change Initiative land cover data set, the World Cover, and Dynamic World. And these three data sources, they really are very different. Um, temporally, uh, CCILC and Dynamic World has a, a longer time scale than World Cover. World Cover only covers, I think, up for now two years. Um, but then there's also the huge spatial resolution. Um, CCILC today is no longer considered high spatial resolution. Um, world Cover and Dynamic World are. And then um, there's also differences in how classes are defined. CCILC and World Cover really um, align better with the UN FAO land cover classification system, while Dynamic World does not. And in amongst all of those, we obviously, I think, are all aware of the prediction accuracy issues that um, these data sets um, have. But amidst the different data sources that we were looking to, the CCILC was still considered for us our best option, specifically because we're trying to look over multiple decades um, into changes in land cover, land cover, particularly for assessing biodiversity pressures. So 
a question could be here when we look at these three data sources. Here we have an example for Portugal and Colombia. Um, this is 2021 for those three key data sources. So are they different? I think when I look at these results, I'm reminded of um, Al Gore's movie, uh, An Inconvenient Truth, where you had Africa and South America, and he would say to the audience, uh, did they ever fit together? Here, I would ask myself the other question, how dissimilar could they be? We look at uh, things like grassland and cropland, and they are so different in results in terms of the percentage they estimate. And it's not just a spatial resolution issue. Um, when we really start digging into why this could be happening, uh, it's the way we aggregate the land cover classes. They're not the same. So when we try and match, and match them together, that's not ideal. There's obviously low prediction accuracies for certain land cover classes. Um, things like inland water are much more easily um, predictable than uh, grassland or shrubland. And then there's also just the different ways in which they define land cover classes themselves. Um, I think for like artificial surfaces, if I'm correctly remembering, dynamic worlds has a much broader uh, interpretation of what artificial surfaces is. And uh, so all of these things um, make it really complicated. And I think today we're at a stage with this particular type of environmental data that the question is not, is there data? The question is, could you please harmonize it? <laughs> So what did we do with the CCILC? We, we, we wanted to create a set of indicators that could give us some idea of potential biodiversity pressures. A first domain is looking at natural and semi-natural vegetated land. And what we essentially do when you look at this matrix is we look at which kind of land cover conversions do we think, you know, in this case, natural and semi-natural land covers that disappear into artificial surfaces, bare area, or cropland, and then vice versa if there's a gain of natural and semi-natural vegetated land. In the second stage, we looked at um, deforestation and reforestation, or better said, tree cover gain and loss. Um, but only tree cover gain and loss related to when it goes from and to these non-vegetated land areas. And this is important to remember when we look at findings. For cropland um, expansion and contraction, similarly, we looked at changes from natural and semi-natural vegetated land into cropland and vice versa. And finally, we looked at also gains and losses, but these are mostly gains today of urban and infrastructure development, so um, how, um, non, uh, how vegetated lands essentially turn into artificial surfaces. And that's kind of the indicator set we built in this particular work. So at the end, this is kind of how our matrix looks. At the OECD, um, there's 38 member countries, but there's also an, a range of OECD partner countries. And I show this because sometimes we look at country aggregates and results in a broader sense and not just on a national or subnational scale. Um, some of these OECD partner countries are accession countries in the process of potentially becoming members, and some of these are um, just partner, strategic partnerships um, in terms of various policy domains. Here we're looking at the um, net change in these four key themes over a two-decadal period. And what we see that across the OECD, um, there's actually uh, a decrease still in natural and semi-natural vegetated land over two decades. Um, there's also a slight decrease in cropland and you can see kind of this significant increase in artificial surfaces. At OCP partner countries, we see that this loss of natural and semi-natural vegetated land is much larger. And um, a large part of that is also due to a loss of tree cover. Um, this is kind of expected because we all know that OCD partner countries, many of those started the process of urbanization or so later. So we would kind of expect these kinds of results. When we look um, at the national level, we see um, countries like the United States or uh, Brazil that have significant areas where there's this loss of natural and semi-natural vegetated land. In Europe, for example, you see it being a little bit more blue indicating there's a, uh, an increase in natural and semi-natural vegetated lands. But it's important here to indicate that, yeah. 
This is actually just percentages. This is not absolute amounts. And countries like the US have much larger and vaster spaces of natural and semi-natural vegetated land, so it doesn't show that here. Um, so actually, Europe has a lot of catching up to do compared to other countries, of course. Here we looked at tree cover changes from 2022 to 2000. Um, I wanted to remind, of course, we're looking here at tree cover loss and gain only when it's lost and gained from artificial surfaces or bare area or cropland, right? Um, and we see sign of actually an interesting result, for example, for EU27, because EU27 often talks about how it's reforesting the continent. Um, but here, actually, we detected that it's a little bit slight negative. Um, and I think here it's an important point, I think that was made earlier today already, when we're looking at tree cover, it's not the same as forest. And that's kind of a challenge that we're really facing as well um, when dealing with countries is um, tree cover, it doesn't encompass necessarily the same thing in terms of definitions that uh, countries are looking at. Countries might consider themselves increasing in terms of forest, but overall the total tree cover might be decreasing. Here's another example of looking at artificial surfaces. Here we see that uh, the majority of countries obviously have an increase over the past two decades in artificial surfaces. Um, and you can see this in each time these five-year intervals. Uh, some of the countries with the highest increase over the last two decades are countries like China and India. So that's why also the OECD partner country aggregate is higher um, than the OECD aggregate. But so having looked at these results, um, I think the more important point is how much is this aligning with what countries are reporting? And part of this work as well was actually looking at national land cover data. So these are geospatial data that countries like Austria or Brazil actually publish online and use. And we wanted to see, well, how much do they actually align with what we're producing as estimates? And um, you can see actually, it doesn't, it's not that bad. <laughs> it's quite well aligned, but then for cases like in Brazil, you'd see that there's a four, almost a 4% difference um, when it comes to cropland. Or um, in the case of Austria, you can see there's a more than 10% difference for certain classes like shrublands and grasslands. So these are the kinds of questions that do come up uh, still when we're dealing with countries um, when they have questions. And uh, they're not easily um, explainable always, especially because if you then start going into technical jargon of why that may be, um, people can get lost. And I'll leave it to my colleague to finish. So, uh, so uh, how do we see the opportunities and the challenges here? So, first of all, is the consistency with countries' official statistics, official data, what uh, Mikael showed. Uh, this is really a key challenge for us um, because all the work we do, uh, it's, it, we discuss it in, in meetings with, with country delegates. So. It's kind of a compromise uh, approach. Um, there is, of course, a, a trade-off between being globally consistent and locally detailed. So, so um, we, uh, that's something we always need to work with. Um, well, we see one way to overcome the, um, the consistency issues with the official statistics is to um, integrate all sources of data. This is a gener general point. Um, often. Um, um, this is probably less of a case for, for land cover, but in general, in Earth observation, um, it helps to use all of the available information to achieve uh, the best alignment between um, uh, the products. Um, the one thing I, I said in the past, but I think it's still valid, is the unsatisfactory understanding of, un of uncertainty. Um, ideally, we would like to see some sort of an uncertainty metric, if not, in, uh, say, at the pixel level. Uh, that's the kind of uh, data economists are used to working with. There is always a confidence interval associated with an estimate. Um, we don't get that uh, from land cover maps. Um, I understand that it's difficult. Um, so I, w I wonder whether other ways, there are other ways to, to meet this kind of uh, need. For example, through more um, 
more detailed validation exercise, more detailed validation uh, statistics. Um, I don't know. Um, then uh, another issue that's very important, uh, and I, I see that, that many of you are working on this, is the, the, the ability to distinguish natural versus anthropogenic causes of change. So all the work that I, I saw today, uh, we are very much looking forward to the, to the results. Um, yes, there is uh, so continued demand for analysis-ready data sets um, that not only have time series but are interoperable. So the harmonization with some sort of a standard. So natural, typically people would turn to the SCA, the system of um, economic environmental um, accounting, the central framework. However, as we know, the SIA classifications of land cover land use are very crude. In my view, they are insufficient, uh, insufficiently detailed. So uh, there is a revision coming of the CICF. So um, if you feel like you have ideas, you want to propose changes, uh, the, the opportunity is coming. Um, and finally, th there is a rising need to be able to um, um, assign or allocate different environmental uh, measures to uh, the industry and sectoral classifications um, uh, in order to be able to conduct, for example, policy effectiveness analyses. I'll stop here. There are other things, of course, uh, when uh, think, uh, thinking of biodiversity pressures that we would like to take into account in addition, land cover, in, in, in addition to land cover, such as land use, such as species, data, habitat fragmentation indices, etc. So uh, that's, that's for the future. Um, thank you very much. L happy to take questions. <laughs>